Welcome everyone, my name is Worthy Pickle and this is your channel for all things Starfield. So a lot of you guys have actually requested that I take each of the videos I made breaking down the major gameplay mechanics of Starfield and compile them into one easy to follow video. So that's what I've done here. I've trimmed them down just a little bit so it's easier to follow and I've also added chapters separating each uh, gameplay mechanic so it's a little bit easier to skip around to the features you'd like. Uh, but other than that, I hope you guys enjoy. As always, be sure to let me know in the comments what type of videos you'd like me to make in the future. But until next time, stay worthy. Today we're going to be talking about everything that we know about Starfield Settlements. Unlike other Bethesda games, it seems like this is going to be a very in-depth base building mechanic that's really going to enhance your experience with the game. It seems that the Hearthfire Skyrim DLC as well as Fallout 4 settlement system was really just a test pilot for what base building could be in a video game. Honestly, settlement building might just be the feature that I'm most excited about with Starfield. And trust me, there's a lot more to settlements than you think. There was a lot that was shown in this last showcase, as well as the original reveal trailer. Um, and I'll be breaking that all down in this video. We're actually gonna be covering a few different main topics, and that's gonna be where you can build your settlements, crews, the purpose that base building has, automating cargo ships, manufacturing and resource collecting, possible defense systems for your base, and throughout the video, I'm also gonna be pointing out a few details that I found interesting. If you're looking forward to Starfield though, be sure to subscribe for some more content, leave a like and comment what other videos you'd like to see from me. All these videos I've come out with so far have been suggestions by you guys. So if there's something you'd like me to cover, just drop it down in the comment section and I'll see if I can put something together for you. Now, there's a lot you can do with settlements in Starfield, but before you can do anything, of course, you're gonna have to figure out where you wanna build your settlement in the first place. Now, there's a lot of systems to choose from. Each system's very unique. They're gonna have different planets and different moons. And depending on the resource that you may need or, or what you're looking to do with the settlement, you're gonna need to choose a certain system that has a planet that you like. But once you look at the planet, the most important thing you gotta do is scan it. Once you scan it, you can see the unique materials to that planet. And there's actually various regions. You can see it on the screen now. There's different regions that have different resources. The examples you see here are chlorine and iron. So if your goal is to collect a certain resource, you just pick the region and the planet that has that resource. You pick nearly any spot that you like in that area and you can set up an outpost and collect that resource. Now, what if you don't want to set up an outpost for resource collecting? Maybe you just want to stay there. It has an awesome view. You found something funny and you want to set up an outpost. Where can you set up an outpost? Well, let's listen to what a developer has to say. After some exploring, you can find a spot to set up a base camp. Outposts can be built almost anywhere on any planet. Now, according to what he's saying here, one might hypothetically want to travel to Mars, take the Mars rover, and have that on their back porch as a poker table. And it, it sounds like that's a very feasible thing to do. Maybe you can, maybe you can't, we don't really know. But that would be pretty darn cool if I could have that as my poker table. All right, so we've determined that you can place the settlement or the outpost practically anywhere, but let's take a step back and just think, why would we want a settlement in the first place? I found three main reasons why you'd want to build a settlement. The first two are for making money, that's resource collecting and manufacturing. The third reason is just to have a cool place to live and put all your crap. All right, so having a place to put all your stuff is pretty straightforward, so we'll put that to the side and let's take a deeper look at resource collecting and manufacturing. Once you've determined the resource and the place that you want to build the settlement, the first thing you'll need is power. Power is generated through these unique wind turbines, and I also imagine that there's going to be solar power, but when I went back through the footage, I actually couldn't find normal solar panels. I saw satellites that look like solar panels, uh, but if I'm mistaken, please let me know in the comments. I, I don't believe there's actual just standard solar panels, but I could be mistaken there. After you have enough power supplied through those wind turbines, you're then able to set up the extractors. The ex extractors are essentially the mining machine that's collecting the resource while you are away. I also imagine that you're going to have to set up some type of storage facility or silo, whatever it may be, to collect the resource and pile it up. At that point, you can choose whether you want to sell the resource or you can look into manufacturing. We don't know everything about manufacturing or how it works, but we do know a couple things and we can speculate a couple things. But let's start with this clip here. And you can hire characters you meet to keep it up and running. 
This is a really important line because it not only implies that you can automate the resource collecting, but you can also automate manufacturing, meaning you can take multiple resources, hire out some type of crew, and that crew will then combine that resource into an item or a material that you can sell for, I'm assuming, more of a profit. We also know that we can set up different trade routes between our settlements and our outposts. So let's say we want to make our outpost as efficient as possible. We could build one settlement on one planet that collects just iron. We can also set up a separate settlement that collects just lead. Now let's say we can manufacture some type of item that requires just those two components. We can set up a trade route where we have our crew fly ships from uh, both settlements collecting both of those resources, bringing them to a third settlement that is just a manufacturing facility. So you combine those two resources, you have your crew then sitting at these workbenches creating this item that requires those two resources, and then they can stash it at that location. So when you fast travel to that location, you can then collect the resources and then sell it for a massive profit. And you can do this on a grand scale. You can do this with as many resources as possible, as many settlements as possible, and you can manufacture all of these items and sell it for a massive profit. And that brings us to our next topic, which is hiring or setting up crews to essentially run your outpost for you. We learn most of this from the spaceship customization and assigning people to your spaceship, but we can take that same information and take it over to our outposts as well. So just like customizing your ship's crew, you can do the same thing for your outpost. If you have a certain amount of jobs that need to be done, you collect that many people or you hire that many people and you assign them to specific roles if you want them to manufacture or build certain items or mine certain items. You just find that person that has a specialty in that item, you assign it to them and they will accomplish that work for you. One thing to note here as well is you can see at the very bottom it says security mini bot. Now this is super interesting because if you go back to the clip that I showed a little bit earlier, you see these little robots kind of zipping around the room doing who knows what, but it sounds like there's mini bots or even larger robots that we can hire that accomplish different tasks for us. And I assume it's a set cost that's probably a little bit more, but you don't have to pay them weekly or monthly like I assume we'll have to pay our human workers. While on the topic of the security bot, there's only one reason why you'd need security, and that's because your base can be attacked. This means you're going to have to be really careful where you put your settlement. Maybe you need to put it on higher ground so it's easier to defend, or maybe you can put it up against a wall or a rock so you have something protecting a single side of your settlement. Either way, I think it would be pretty interesting to have the certain settlements that extract the, extract the material, and that one wouldn't need as much protection because you are shipping the material out right away. However, if you have a manufacturing facility that holds the material, you really got to bunker that down like a fort. Got to make sure you have a lot of security bots or people on duty protecting, because if you get raided or attacked, you got to be able to defend the material that you just spent so much effort crafting. And it's not just ores that we're extracting. We can actually farm resources for plants and animals. With the help of your scanner, you'll chart the uncharted and discover exotic wildlife. If you have the skills, you can even figure out that certain creatures and plants, you can build an outpost and produce resources from those plants and animals. You can get experience and rewards for fully surveying planets and fully surveying a whole system. While we do see a little clip of a greenhouse for farming plants for their resources, it's not quite clear how we're going to tame or multiply animals for mass production of their resources. It's not like Minecraft where we can just swish around some hay and then boom, we have a bunch of cows. <laughs> but I imagine that we can um, collect the animals or whatever they are in, in a single space where we can then multiply them and collect their resources. They do show us four specific resources that we can farm from plants and animals. The first is from a moth wing. It looks like we can extract fiber from farming them. We also have the sail gator, which that one we can get pigment from the sail gator. There's also dragons in this, just like Skyrim, and that one we can get sealant. And then lastly, speaking of Minecraft, it looks like we can farm creepers as well, and that gives us toxin instead of gunpowder. Now, the very last thing that I want to mention with these settlements is just how cozy you can actually make it. It's not just a resource collecting facility where you have a bunch of slave labor. 
you can make it like home. I mean, when you look at this screenshot here, you can see this little bot roaming around. He's there to clean up. You have three different types of seats. You have a, a cool coffee table there with what looks like a model boat to me. Maybe it's just a little pixelated. You've got a weight set. What, what I absolutely love too is the mannequin. Just like Skyrim, you can have the mannequin for uh, your armor or cool collector's items that you find. And then if you look at the very back, that looks like a ping pong table to me. If we can actually play ping pong, I am going to lose my mind. But that's enough of what I think. What do you guys think of the settlement system? Will you be spending time on this or will you stick to the quests? Today we're going to be diving deep into everything that we know about ships in Starfield. I'm going to break down and simplify the ship systems and stats. We're also going to look at the customization system for your ships, what crews are going to look like, and lastly, what type of encounters we can expect while we're out and about in space. Also, for those of you that enjoy speculation, I'm also going to talk about my thoughts on whether or not we can own large ships like the battleship UC Vigilance or the party cruise ship that we saw in the showcase, and I'll be discussing that speculation at the end of this video. As always though, thank you guys so much for stopping by and watching the video. It's been amazing to see just how many of you are as excited for Starfield as I am. If you do enjoy this video though and you want to see more, please leave a like and subscribe to the channel. Uh, but with that being said, let's go ahead and jump right into Starfield ship systems and stats. Now, whether we like it or not, we're going to be spending hours of our time on our ship. So it comes to no surprise that close to a third of this last showcase was focused on ships, our encounters in space, customizing our ships, assigning crew members, everything revolving ships. It took a lot of that recent showcase. So with all this time that we'll be spending on our ships, it's going to be really important that we understand how our ship works and how to understand the stats when we're looking at customizing our ship. So let's look at our starter ship, the Frontier, to break it down. The first system to pay attention to is the reactor or power system shown here up at the top left. Based on your reactor power output, you'll have an equal amount of these notches that you can allocate to different parts of your ship. So in this case, our reactor puts out 14 power. So then we have 14 of these little notches that we can put in any of these six parts of our ship. We're going to talk more about this a little bit later in the video when we get to the combat and encounters. Uh, but for now, to keep it simple, we have lasers, ballistics, and missiles as our primary method of dealing damage. So you're going to want to invest more here if you plan to be in combat. You can also invest in engines to increase your ship speed. We also have shield to increase your ability to withstand damage. This essentially recharges your shield faster. And then lastly, we have the grav drive. So if you want to warp out of combat or warp faster or slower, you'll want to allocate more or less in this section. Keep in mind, you're going to be constantly changing these stats on the go. If you're wandering around and just exploring, you're going to want to put these stats in the engine and grav drive to make things a little more convenient. But if you're jumping into combat, you're going to want to quickly move these notches into your weapons and shields so you don't get absolutely wrecked by an enemy ship. The next section that we can see shows our fuel, hull, and cargo. Fuel shows how far we'll be able to grab jump before we need to refuel. And this is going to directly tie in with our jump range that you can see down here. You can't travel further than your jump range in a single jump. But you can grab jump multiple times back to back as long as you don't run out of fuel. So in my opinion, it sounds like upgrading your total fuel would be the easier and cheaper way of traveling to further solar systems than increasing your jump range as a whole. Um, that's a bit more expensive to upgrade. Now, when it comes to your ship's health, you actually have two different metrics to look at. You have your whole health, which here we see is 366, but you also have your shield capacity down here. Once your shield is broken, the enemy will start damaging your hull. We also know that enemies can damage specific parts of your ship, so they can destroy your fuel tanks, weapon systems, or even your thrusters. We don't know exactly how that's going to work or if it's going to cost money to repair the ship or if it repairs over time, but just something to keep in mind when you're looking at uh, staying alive and not blowing up in space. Moving down, we have cargo capacity. A few things to note here, they, they really overloaded the ship with storage, so we know that is possible to do. And if it's anything like past Bethesda games, there's normally a negative effect to this. In most of their games, you just run much slower or be forced to walk. So I'm assuming we would be able to fly much slower if we are over encumbered, or we won't be able to grab jump if we are beyond a certain limit of being over encumbered. 
There's also this little section here called shielded capacity. On the surface, it sounds like this would be cargo that's protected by our shield, but I actually think that this is cargo that is protected from contraband scanners. We don't know, but that's going to be my guess. Maintain your current course while we scan your ship's cargo. Scan complete. We can also see our crew capacity here. To start out, we can only have two crew members, but as you'll see later in this video, this can be increased or decreased depending on how you customize the ship. And lastly, we can see whether or not the ship is registered, the value of the ship, and the mass. Again, we're gonna get into this a little more later. It'll make sense when we get into customization and random encounters. I also forgot to mention the lasers, ballistic, and missile numbers that you see here is just the overall rating of the weapon systems on your ship. All right, we've been talking lots of numbers, so let's take a quick break from the ship systems and stats, and let's talk about some random encounters that we can expect while we're in our ship. We'll often stumble upon other ships while exploring. Some of these just want to talk, extend side quests, or even want to trade. Others are gonna try to attack and steal our cargo. As always, we have the choice to do what we want. Nothing is stopping us from boarding a friendly ship, pretending to trade, and then murdering all of them just because we like how their ship looks and we want to steal it. One of my favorite features is the ability to board a ship and interact with other people in person. If we're being attacked, we can shoot out their engines so that they're immobile, board their ship, kill their crew, steal their supplies, and even sell their ship for cash. If that's too much work, you can always just blow them up and loot the scraps without even leaving your ship. You can also come across random places like shipyards. Similar to a city on a planet, you can dock, talk with people for various missions, but you can also find unique upgrades and new ships to buy. I feel like this one would be pretty cool because it's a bunch of random people gathering together at a shipyard. Every time you land, I'm sure there's a lot of different people and it's not the same type of cycle of people like a city would be. Um, you can also dock with giant Star Wars types battleships. These are very similar to No Man's Sky. You can actually see they have uh, fleets of smaller ships surrounding that single ship. You can also find random cruise ships that are full of the wealthy elite of the settled systems. I'm curious to see with these if their rewards or payouts are going to be bigger than the average side quest because they are so wealthy. And then one really unique encounter that they show is coming across a group of people that thought they were the only ones to leave Earth. So they have all these plants and uh, different things set up to be self-sufficient on, on their ship. This one we're going to talk a little bit more about later because it does make me question a few things that not many people are talking about. But first, let's look at how combat will work. We've explained how most of these systems work already. You have a point system you'll be constantly changing to make sure you have enough power as you need to your weapons and shield while in a fight. You're also going to want to invest in the targeting control system pretty early on. This essentially gives you a VAT system in your ship to target specific parts of the enemy ships. This will make disabling and boarding other ships much, much easier. It's also important to note, while you have a general number rating for the strength of your weapons, investing more notches in your weapon systems doesn't necessarily make them more powerful. It does, however, make them reload quicker giving you more of an edge when attacking the enemy. You can see here, when you shoot, the total ammo goes down. Once you stop firing, you have a short delay before the ammo starts refilling. So allocating more power to your weapons will let you fire more consistently because it does reload the, the weapon quicker with a shorter delay. You're also gonna wanna prioritize what weapon system you use depending on what you're trying to do. From this, we can see that energy affects shield more while ballistic damages the hull more and EM weapons are better at targeting specific systems. So picking the right weapon for the job will make you that much more deadly. All right, now it's time to talk about the most complex part of this video, and that's the shipbuilding and customization. It's hard to know everything about shipbuilding before we get our hands on the game, but I'm gonna do my best to walk you through what we know from the showcase. When looking at your ship, you have two main options at the bottom of the screen. You can enter the more complex ship builder if you want to build your ship from scratch or change a lot of the settings there, or you can just easily upgrade specific aspects of your ship with this second option. So let's first look at the upgrader. I imagine a lot of you will actually just use the upgrader option because it is so simple. The ship builder is going to be a lot more complex and you'll see that in a second, but I imagine a lot of you are going to be buying a pre-made ship and then using the upgrader to make it better versus spending the hours on end building your ship from scratch. Maybe I'm wrong, but I imagine once we actually get our hands on the game, we'll be surprised just how many people don't want to mess with the ship builder. All right, there's a lot to break down with the upgrader, so let's get started. At the very bottom, you see a general summary of your ship stats that we broke apart a little bit earlier, just looked a little bit different. Just above that, you see the different parts you can easily upgrade. We see three weapons, 
engines and shield, though there's arrows on each side, so I imagine you can upgrade pretty much every part of your ship through this upgrader just by scrolling to the side and picking the part that you want to upgrade. So let's say we want to upgrade our weapon. Clicking on that option opens up this menu. We can see a list of available weapons from the vendor on the right. Each one has different stats shown on the left. We see range, fire rate, hold damage, shield damage, max power, hole, and crew capacity. One thing to note is just how expensive an upgrade is. This dragon laser costs almost as much as our entire ship. So if you want tips on how to make money through settlement building, be sure to watch my settlement building guide. You're also going to want to invest in the Starship design skill if you want better weapons and modules for your ship. There's quite a few upgrades we see in this showcase that require higher, higher skill ratings in this, so don't neglect it. If you want more customization options though, the ship builder option is going to be better for you. Here you can move, upgrade, and build everything about your ship. So here's a quick overview of all the components of your ship. We have the cowling, which is mostly cosmetic, the shield generator, the docker, which allows you to dock with enemy ships in space, fuel tanks, the grav drive, weapons, various habs, engines, the cockpit, cargo hold, the reactor, the bay, and the landing gears. In this clip, we see a few options for habs. Just within this Nova hab, there's various styles and options to choose from. Each one serves a different purpose. We see an all-in-one option, an armory, a captain's quarters, a computer core, and a control station. Each one has different amounts of control stations for uh, crews. It adds different amounts of hull health and features that it can bring your ship. Once we pick the style that suits us best, we can take apart and place the hab where we want it to be, and the blue circles indicate snap points where we can actually place that item. It seems that habs are going to be the biggest part of interior customization we're going to have. I'll show you some of these options on the screen now, but each one is very different and serves a very different purpose. If you want a room to store all your weapons and armor, or a place to call home and have your own bedroom, or even have a section of the ship dedicated to your crew to sleep or work, habs are where you're going to find these options. Habs are what makes your ship feel like home. Habs are also where you're going to make your ship productive. It's important to place the workstations that you actually want to focus on. So if you want to make your ship a flying research lab or have your crew manufacture items on the go, the habs are going to be where you do that. I'll also add something as simple as a single hab that has a mass of eight will lower your mobility and jump range rather significantly. So shipbuilding is going to be a game of balance, making sure you have the things that you want, but you also got to make sure that you have the power to sustain those modules and mass is going to be a big player in that. Here we see some options for cowling, as I mentioned earlier, they're mostly cosmetic, but they do add mass and value to your ship. After that, they show us an upgraded grav drive, allowing us to grav jump further and quicker. This one happens to be a class A, but based on the stats of this particular grav drive, I don't think the class indicates how good or bad it is, but maybe it's just the style or type of grav drive. We also see that we can fully customize the color of each part of our ship. They then show us this massive cockpit that holds up to eight crew stations. You can see the inside of the ship here as well. One thing I did notice is that this cockpit has multiple pilot seats. I'm wondering what type of effect this will have on our flying if we assign crew members to fly with us or pilot with us. I'm assuming that it's going to greatly increase our maneuverability, but let me know what you guys think. Now, one thing that really surprised me in this showcase is that the cargo holds aren't just something we see from the outside like most games, but they're physical rooms that we can walk into. One of the developers uses this as a stash for the sandwiches she collects. I imagine my cargo holds will also be full of some random stuff that I pick up, but we don't really know whether our ship cargo is going to be filled with items that we randomly place inside the ship, such as items like sandwiches that we place on a table or drop on the ground, or if that number simply includes the items we store in crates in those cargo holds. I imagine our total cargo will include those items we drop on the ground, but we don't know that just yet. Next we see a landing bay. The biggest thing to note here is just how customizable shipbuilding is. We can place a landing bay here on the back of the ship at the bottom. It doesn't have to be in the center like most of the starter ship showed us. However, there are rules that need to be followed. We can see this by the warning or error messages in the bottom right hand corner while we're building. Of course, each ship is going to be required to have things like a reactor, pilot seat, fuel, and engines to even fly, but we don't know what other rules have to apply for the ship design to be successful. Now that we have a good overview of the ship builder, let's take a look at a few different ship designs that they showed us in the showcase just to see how much freedom we have with our ship building. 
I also want to take this time to thank those of you who have made it this far in the video. If you are enjoying so far, be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel so you can stay up to date with all the new Starfield content that I'll be coming out with. So how will crews play a part in our starships? If you've seen my settlement breakdown video, you already have a good idea of what crews do in Starfield. Uh, they do work a little bit different though between settlements and ships, so let's take a look at what we know about our ship crew. Crew members can be acquired by progressing the main story with Constellation members. Uh, you can also find them while you're out adventuring or hire them at spaceports. Each crew member will have a unique skill set that they can contribute to your outpost or your ship. So you'll also have to choose whether or not the member will best fit the role on the ship or in settlements. But let's put settlements to the side and just focus on ships by looking at the different skills that we'll want for our ship crew. So the first person that we see is Sarah. With her, she has the skill of astrodynamics. While we haven't really seen this skill in action based on what astrodynamics is, it most certainly uh, gives fuel and jump distance buffs to your ship. Hers has quite a few stars, so this one's gonna be really good. We also see lasers. This one, when we saw it in the showcase, it didn't specify if it was for just handheld weapons or for ships as well. We know that ships, you are able to have laser weapons, so I'm sure it benefits that as well. And then we see leadership and botany, which aren't specific to ships, so we are just gonna skip those. After Sarah, we see Sam. He specializes in piloting, which will assist in your ship's maneuverability in and out of combat. So this is gonna be a must have on your crew for that reason alone. He's also rather adept in payload skill, which will automatically boost how much cargo you can hold, which is fantastic. Rifle and geology won't really help us on a ship crew, so we aren't going to discuss those either. Moving on to my guy Barrett, starship engineering skill is required for some components of upgrading your ship, uh, similar to a skill that we discussed earlier, um, but Barrett, having him on your ship maybe allow you to skip upgrading that skill and still be able to upgrade those components. I'm not completely sure on that, but that would be pretty sweet. Uh, we also see the particle beam weapon system. That one's pretty straightforward. This will improve the particle beam weapons that you have on your ship. Robots really won't really help much, or robotics. Uh, gastronomy, though, gives the user better crafting options for food. So I wonder if assigning Barrett to a workbench on your ship would allow him to craft better foods while you're out and about and just kind of automate that process. That would be pretty sweet, but we don't really know if that's going to be an option. The next one we see is a random person that we can hire at a spaceport. Shotguns really won't help a ship out, but like lasers, I assume ballistics will also help the ballistic weapons on our ship. And then the last one is the particle beam weapon system that we just talked about. The last crew member we see is Heller. He can be acquired through a random encounter by stumbling upon him and saving him. He has geology and outpost engineering, which means he's completely useless to our ship, so you might as well just murder him and steal his stuff. All right, guys, we're almost done. The last thing we'll talk about with crews is the crew roster that you can see here. This shows each member uh, of the crew that we just talked about in a simple to read format, where you can then choose where you'd like each member to work, whether on the outpost or on the starship, just based on the skills that they do have. The only thing that's new here is the mini bot here at the bottom. We know that they can work on our outpost, but we actually haven't seen them working on our ships. So I'd be kind of curious to see if we can assign them to some type of role on our starship. I did promise you that I'd talk about my thoughts on whether or not we can purchase and fly larger ships like the battleship that we saw in the showcase. Now, while nothing is confirmed, there are two things that we saw that make me think it may just be possible. The first thing is the fact that when we saw the large battleship, it takes us inside the ship and we see the very same command table that is standard on our ships as well. Well, this could simply just be cosmetic and Bethesda trying to keep everything universal. If we could fly one of these massive ships, it would be required to have this table. So it may just be possible to use that table ourselves. The second reason why I think it may just be possible is because of the assets that we see on the ship of the people who thought they were the only ones to leave Earth. These people on their ship have indoor plots for growing crops, and they're actually quite a bit different from the ones that we see on the settlements. So I don't think that they're made for just this ship alone, but they would use those assets somewhere else. And I think it would be very possible for us to own a large ship and have our own crop farms that, that are automated on our ship. If that were the case, we may just be able to have our own massive ship that we could have that crop farm on. Now, full disclosure, I may have just had one too many skumas, but, but let me know what you guys think in the comments section. 
All right, that is everything that we know so far about starships in Starfield. I just spent the last 12 hours making this video, so I'm gonna go grab some Aurora from Neon and take a nap. And like the title suggests, I'm gonna be breaking down the backgrounds as well as the traits that you can choose from when creating a new character. And that's gonna be from the original reveal trailer as well as this recent one uh, that was just the, this last week. And there's actually been some interesting changes, so I'm very curious what you guys are going to be playing. Uh, when you start, I'll, I'll let you know what I'm actually going to be going with, at least as of right now. But I'm curious what you guys are going to do. Uh, but let's start with the backgrounds. And we're also going to start with the original showcase. And then at the end, we're going to transition to what we uh, just learned from this recent one. So let's go ahead and just jump right into uh, the backgrounds. The first one that we see is Chef. And when we're looking at these, each and individual background they have three different benefits that you get for picking that background each one is different depending on the background um, but I'm going to go through each of those three benefits I'm going to go through each of the backgrounds and just kind of break them down um, these are quite a bit different than when they originally revealed the game they're all descriptions now which is interesting the original showcase had like a 10% bonus here 15% bonus here but in the new showcase, there's no numbers. It's all descriptions, which is interesting. But the first one, Chef, the first benefit that we see is gastronomy. And the description says access to brand new worlds means access to brand new ingredients. And there is almost no limit to the delicious foods and drinks a talented chef can prepare. I imagine with this, there'll be just special recipes you get um, that are going to benefit you more than your average recipe that everyone else can make. Uh, maybe extra health, or if there's an active effect you get, it'll just be a little bit stronger, which is pretty cool. The second strength uh, or benefit that you get is dueling. Considered by many to be the lost art, close attacks with a melee weapon can often be deadlier than ranged combat when carried out by a skilled practicer. I, I really hope that you can get like a, a butcher knife <laughs> and just swing around with a butcher knife. That'd be really fun for a playthrough with the chef. Um, but really, I, I bet you just get a 10 or 15% bonus to uh, melee damage or something like that. Um, the last benefit for Chef is scavenging. There are those who find just about anything um, who, or who can find just about anything. And their success is usually dependent on knowing how and where to look. So I don't know. Maybe you just get more ingredients when you're scavenging and stuff. Who knows? Um, the second background we see, though, is combat medic. This is normally... The, the type of background I pick when I play a game, um, but I don't find it super interesting. It, <laughs> at least that's my opinion, uh, but you'll get pistol certification. And that says considering the popularity of the personal sidearm in the settled systems, familiarity with such a weapon is often considered essential. Um, if you're playing a Han Solo kind of playthrough, I like that right there is what you need. <laughs> you need the pistol certification. Um, I imagine you just get a boost in pistol damage. Um, and then the second benefit you get is medicine. Only through advancements in medical training and technology has humanity been able to withstand the galaxy's many dangers. I assume you just get a boost when you eat food or take a med pack or something. Um, the last benefit being wellness. By embracing an active lifestyle and good nutrition habits, one may improve their overall sense of health. I assume you just get a boost in your health points. 10 points or 10% or something like that. Um, the third background that we see is Cyber Runner. This is your stealth background or stealth playthrough. This is the one that you'd want to pick. Um, the first benefit being stealth. For a combatant who values being discreet above all else, the ability to approach a target while undetected and kill with a silenced weapon is as terrifying as it gets. I think that's pretty cool. I mean, I know... And we know from the, the from the announcement that there are silencers, and I hope you don't have to pick this background to use them. I assume you don't. I bet you just unlock the ability to craft it right away. Um, it kind of sounds like that's what it's uh, assuming right there. Um, but the second benefit you get is security. While the standardized locking mechanism is renowned for its security, any code can be broken with the proper training. Um, so this is pretty straightforward. It, it's lock picking. You get a, a boost in lock picking. And then theft is the last benefit. Uh, while not entirely honorable and certainly not legal, it is nonetheless occasionally necessary to discreetly remove property from another person. Again, pretty straightforward. Uh, you can pick pocket people. This will probably increase your odds of getting away with it. 
Then the fourth background is cyberneticist. This one's pretty straightforward because we already know a couple of the benefits. The first one being medicine. Again, you probably just get a boost in your med pack efficiency. Uh, second benefit is security, which we just saw that one in the last one. Um, your lock picking efficiency is going to be a little bit better there as well. What is new, though, is lasers. Personal laser weapons are in widespread use across the settled systems and specialized training can greatly increase their effectiveness. Now, if you didn't watch this last uh, Starfield Direct or Bethesda Direct, um, they actually showed us how when you're in low gravity or no gravity, when you're in space, if you shoot a normal weapon, it shoots your body backwards, which is pretty cool. Um, but laser weapons don't do that. So I imagine when you're in space, you're going to want to use the laser weapons. So um, this benefit, you'll probably just have increased damage or accuracy or something like that, which is pretty cool. Um, the fifth background, which is definitely the one I am going to be choosing, is Diplomat. With Bethesda games, I find that being able to persuade people is like the best option you can get <laughs> or like one of the traits you really want to invest in early on. Um, but you'll get three benefits with this one, just like the other ones. The first one being persuasion in the settled systems. The nuanced ability to listen and discuss can often accomplish far more than simply shooting first and asking questions later. Again, you can just persuade people to do what you want a little bit easier. But the second uh, benefit is by far the one that I would be choosing this for. Um, and that's commerce. In the settled systems free market economy, almost anyone with the right skill set can open and run a successful business. Now, I love building businesses or kind of empires in video games. So I imagine I'm going to spend a lot of time building up, uh, you know, mining or manufacturing settlements, you know, whatever we're able to do. I'm going to build it out as big as I, I possibly can. <laughs> and I imagine this, you just get a, a selling bonus or maybe your workers are more efficient, which is pretty cool. And then wellness, um, we've seen that already. You just kind of get a boost in your overall health, it sounds like. Um, what's new in the Starfield Direct, though, that we saw that we didn't see in the an original announcement is the background explorer that one, you get a, a few benefits. We've seen lasers before. That's also included on this one. Um, but what is new is astrodynamics. Advanced technology is one thing, but it takes skill, patience, and a little bit of love to get even more capabilities out of a ship's grav drive. So I assume you could just shoot your ship a little bit further. <laughs> you know, go to that further galaxy before your grav drive is upgraded. And then surveying is the last benefit. Humanity now has access to untold alien worlds and the ability to decipher all that data while on the ground has become an essential skill. Um, this one, we don't know a whole lot about surveying or kind of scanning the items. We know that you get rewarded a lot of money if you survey an entire planet and all of the items on it. Um, but I wonder if to, to learn crafting for food or for uh, weapon mods, you have to survey things and that's how you learn those crafting recipes. I don't know. Be pretty interesting to see. Um, but let me know what you guys are going to end up choosing with the background. I'm definitely going to pick diplomat. That's just how I play. I really want to build a big business and that sounds like it's going to help out the most. But I'm, I'm very curious what type of playthroughs you guys are planning on doing and what backgrounds you're going to choose. So let me know in the comments section below um, what you guys are going to pick. So after you create your character, you pick a background. Uh, the character creation moves you over to traits. Traits are really interesting because you actually don't have to pick any of them. You can do up to three, but every single one of the traits has a benefit as well as a, a negative effect that you'll get from it. So I don't know. Maybe maybe I'll do all three. I, I probably will. I'll, I'll tell you which ones I'm choosing. Um, but it's kind of interesting because you'll have to deal with some negative effects if you want the benefit of it. Most of these we already knew. Uh, we learn of two new ones in this showcase as well as they totally changed one of them. Um, so we'll go ahead and start from the top and run you through each of them. Uh, the first one is introvert. That one's pr pretty straightforward. Uh, you get more endurance when adventuring alone, but less when you're adventuring with a companion. So if you're planning on doing kind of a solo playthrough, you don't like companions, choose that one. <laughs> like without a question, just do it. You'll get a buff. Um, the opposite of that is the second trait we see, which is extrovert, which is, again, the complete opposite. So you'll get uh, less endurance when you're adventuring alone, but more when you're with a companion. 
Uh, third one's kid stuff. This is probably my favorite one. I, I think it's a, a brilliant idea. But kid stuff, um, your parents are actually live and you get to visit them. They, they actually showed uh, you visiting them in the showcase, which is pretty cool. Um, but in the previous showcase, they said you have to pay 10%. Um, I believe in the new showcase, it was 2%. So you have to pay them 2% um, of all of your money will actually go to them, which I think is a good change. 10% was pretty high. 2% I, I think is a little more in line. I'll put it up on the screen. So if I have that number wrong, um, you'll, you'll see the correct number on the screen. But I am definitely going to do that one without a question. Uh, fourth one is Neon Rat. Uh, neon street rat actually so you grew up on the mean streets of neon you gain access to special dialogue options as well as better rewards from some missions on neon crime bounty by other factions is greatly increased though that one's pretty cool i don't think i'll do it my first playthrough my first playthrough i i typically like playing the hero but then if i can get away with like stealing or like hijacking a ship or something like i totally will um my second playthrough, I'll probably, probably play the, the evil Star Lord, you know, whatever. <laughs> but uh, first playthrough, I probably won't do that one. Second one, most definitely. Um, we also get some religions that we can choose as a trait. The first one is being raised enlightened. Now, you grew up as a member of the enlightened. You gain a significant discount from uh, the organization store, but you lose access to the Sanctum Universum store. So if you know you're going to be uh, that religion, obviously, it's it's totally worth it. But who knows what's in that other store at this point, you know? Um, the other religion would be being raised universal. You grew up a member of the Sanctum Universum. You gain a significant discount at the church store, but you lose access to the Enlightened store. Pretty straightforward there. The next one is Serpent's Embrace. You grew up worshipping the Great Serpent. Grav jumping provides a temporary boost to health and endurance, but health and endurance are lowered if you don't continue to jump regularly like an addict. This one, I, I wonder how this one's actually going to play out because the grav jump is in your ship. And if you're jumping around in your ship, why do you need player health and player endurance? Or is it, you know, is it active for like 30 minutes? So if I jump to a system and then I land on a planet, you know, and I'm around the planet for 30 minutes. Do I get that that buff? I don't know. It's got to be a long timer. Otherwise, it doesn't really make sense because you're in the ship when you're grab jumping versus the benefits when you're out of the ship, you know. Um, the eighth trait, though, that we see is spaced. Your body has become acclimated to space. Health and endurance are increased when in space, but decreased when on the surface. Um, and I actually, I believe they Etsy showed another one. I, I don't have it written down here on my notes, but I'm, I'm pretty sure, um, they, they alluded to there being another trait where you're kind of, where it's the opposite. So you'll get nerfed when in space, but you'll get the benefit, um, when you're on a planet, they didn't show the description or anything. So I don't really know, but it, it had a name for it, like on the side of the screen. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if that's a thing. A lot of these have kind of the opposite trait that you can choose from as well. So it makes sense. And then in that original showcase, we saw starter home as a trait. This one's really cool. Um, at the time, it was you'd get a, a home on a peaceful moon, but you would get a $50,000 credit mortgage. So that was kind of interesting. But when we look at the new showcase, and I'll put this up on the screen for you guys, they switch this to dream home. So instead of a starter home, you get a luxurious customizable, customizable house on a peaceful planet, and you still get that $50,000 mortgage. This one is really interesting because we also learned in the showcase that, that building your own kind of home or a mine or a resource collection facility, whatever you want to call it, it's really expensive. So for you to get a dream home, you know, really nice house for just $50,000. I don't know if I like that. I feel like it skips the whole progression phase of the game. I, I'm still going to do it. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> like I got to have that dream house. I was going to do the, the little moon house, but a customizable dream home is pretty cool. But I, I almost feel like it gives you too big of a jump when it comes to, you know, base building and stuff like that. But let me know what you think in the, in the comments. Um, one other thought before we move on from this one, you get a $50,000 credit mortgage. That almost makes me think that you can get loans for other things. Like if I want to buy a nicer spaceship, can I get a loan for that spaceship? 
you know, the, the loan features in the game. So is it going to be moved over to uh, other options? I, I think that'd be really interesting to see. I, I almost hope that they don't. Otherwise, you just get massive loans. I'm sure there'd be limits to it, but um, I don't know. I think that'll be kind of interesting to see. Uh, but in the new showcase, besides that one change with the dream home, we get two new traits that they showed us. The first one is hero worshipped. I'm definitely going to do this one as well. Um, you've earned the attention of an annoying, adoring fan who will show up randomly and jabber at you incessantly. On the plus side, he'll join your ship crew and give you gifts. So I'll probably do that. I think it'll be really funny. Hopefully it's not too annoying. Um, but they let you know if you wanted to remove the traits later in the game, there is various ways to remove the trait. So I imagine you can just shoot them in the face and then your problem's kind of gone, <laughs> which would be kind of nice. Um, but I don't know. I feel like early game getting those gifts would be pretty sweet. Later in the game, probably not so much. And that's when you can kill them. The last trait that we see, though, is alien DNA. Uh, you volunteer for a controversial experiment that combines alien and human DNA. As a result, you start with a higher health pool and greater endurance, but healing items aren't as effective. So this one, we actually saw the name in, a, uh, in the previous showcase, but we didn't see the description of it. And people lost their minds, you know, thinking that there's uh, intelligent aliens in the game. I, I think there is going to be some sort of intelligent alien, but I don't think that's what this is alluding to. Um, you know, we've seen aliens in the trailers, at least just kind of animals that aren't from Earth. That's going to be an alien. So I, I really think that's all it's saying here. But lots of traits to choose from. Um, obviously, I, I imagine there's going to be a few more that we haven't seen. And then the backgrounds, I think, are awesome as well. Welcome everybody, my name is Worthy Pickle. I'm assuming if you clicked on this video, you're as excited for Starfield as I am. As the title suggests, I'm going to be taking a look at all of the skills and perks that we learned in this recent showcase, as well as the original reveal uh, trailer showcase that we got last year. I'm going to break down every single one and every bit of information that we know of for each of those skills. This video took me a, a long time to make. Um, so I would appreciate if you guys would leave a like, a uh, comment, if you have any uh, speculation or ideas on what some of these skills are, because we don't know everything about them. And let me know what skills you guys are planning on investing in early in the game, maybe in the late game as well. Um, but before we jump into it, I did want to spend just a second and thank you guys for the support that I've been getting. The last video I made that was breaking down the backgrounds and the traits that you can choose during character creation, I got a lot of support for that and it's been great to see. So I'm going to keep uh, the Starfield content rolling. So if that is something that you guys are interested in, please subscribe. Hopefully we'll see you in some videos after this. Uh, but let's go ahead and get started and, and break down these skills. So I'm going to start off with the skills that we know the most of at the start, uh, break those down in detail. Then we're going to kind of move over to the ones that we know the names of, but we don't really know any details of. At the very end of the video, though, I'm going to cover some additional skills that we got from the original showcase in uh, 2022. The thing with those is they are from an earlier build of the game. I imagine they've changed a little bit. It's also possible that they completely removed them. That's why I'm not put, putting it at the start of the video, uh, just because we don't know if it's going to be in the final build. But I did want to include that at the very end, just in case you guys are interested and uh, kind of want to take a look at all the options that we may have with the skills. So when we look at the skill tree as a whole, it's very similar to other games where at the very top, um, those are the skills you can invest in right at the start. Uh, but as you go down the different layers, it does require that you have points invested in the skill tree as a whole before you can move down. Um, and then once you invest the skill point into a specific skill, it, you're then able to level up into various tiers. Uh, from my understanding, there's four tiers to all of them. Uh, that may not be the case for all of them, but at least the ones that we've seen so far, you can upgrade the tiers four times. And those are done through challenges. You don't have to reinvest skill points. Uh, but you can progress your skill uh, just by using it as a whole. Now, the first skill that we see uh, in the showcase is robotics. The description for that says, in an age where robots and autonomous turrets are employed in a combat capacity, the study of robotics can be instrumental in gaining a tactical edge. So this one, I, we don't really know what any of the, the tiers actually do, but I imagine it uh, makes it a little bit easier to kill different turrets or robots that are fighting against you. I don't know necessarily if it's to boost your own robot. 
you know, like Vasco, um, I imagine this is going to give you an edge in killing those. Uh, the second skill that we see is payloads. It says any pilot can haul cargo, but it takes a special determination and training to maximize cargo space. This one seems pretty straightforward. I imagine uh, the cargo space on your ships, it's going to increase just the cargo size. Uh, so you don't have to necessarily build a giant cargo ship with a million different cargo spaces. You could probably just cram a little bit more uh, items or junk that you pick up into the ship without having to upgrade the ship as a whole. The third skill that we see is security. Um, this one, before we go into the details of security as a whole, I do want to add that we actually saw this um, when we're creating our character in the background options. It's actually one of the benefits we get if we choose, uh, I believe it's Cyber Runner or Cyberneticist. If you choose either of those, it looks like you actually get this skill uh, pre-unlocked or pre-invested in when you start the game um, because it matches exactly word for word what we see in that background. When we look at those backgrounds that I broke down in a previous video, are each of those benefits we get a skill? Uh, we don't really know because we didn't see all of uh, all of those benefits in the skill tree, uh, but maybe some of those or again, maybe all of them are actually skills and you just get them pre-unlocked uh, when you choose that specific background. But going back to the security skill as a whole, uh, the description for this says, while a standardized digital locking mechanism is known for its security, any code can be broken with the proper training. So this is your typical lock picking uh, skill that we've seen in other skill trees in Bethesda games. It's pretty straightforward, but this one's kind of cool because it's the first time that we look at how the tier system actually works. And like I mentioned before, you unlock the individual tiers by completing various challenges, and those are going to be specific to the skill. Um, but the first tier for this one, it allows you to hack advanced locks, and then you get a bank up to two auto attempts. Tier three is very similar, um, or I'm sorry, tier two allows you to hack expert locks and get two auto attempts banked. Rank three, um, this gives you an additional auto attempt like the other ones, but you can then uh, unlock master locks. Rank four, and I imagine this is going to be the case with most of them, rank four is kind of a specialty rank. It's a little more interesting. In this one, I'm kind of curious what you guys think this actually means, um, but it allows you to expend a digipick to eliminate keys that aren't required to solve a puzzle. When I think of this, I think of Skyrim, like the Ebony Claw or the Gold Claw. That was a specific key that was required for a certain puzzle to progress in a mission. Um, so that one, you wouldn't be able to expend a, a digi pick to get past that door. But it seems like if you're breaking into someone's house and it tells you, hey, you have to have Phil's specific house key, this you get to kind of work around that and you can still break into the house without that specific key. That's what I think. Let me know what you guys think in the description if you think I'm kind of wrong or <laughs> you have a better idea of what that means. But that's kind of what I'm thinking. And if you understand what I mean with Ebony Claw, if you've played Skyrim, um, it's it's essentially just a mission specific key. That one you can't work around because obviously that would kind of ruin the fun of the game if you could just kind of break in any door anyway. The next skill that we learn of is Intimidation. If you've played Bethesda games before, you've seen this. Um, it's the ability to strike fear in an opponent, causing them to flee so that you can either escape or attack them first. Typically, I'm not the biggest fan of this in a Bethesda game. I'm a completionist. I like to loot everything. So just the idea that the enemy I'm about to kill may have three or four coins or maybe a couple bullets I can loot, that makes me mentally, I have to kill them and I have to loot them. <laughs> I don't want them to just run away from me because maybe they have something good on them. Um, but I know a lot of people are fans of this, especially if you get bugged by uh, aliens or kind of mercenaries attacking you all the time. You can just make them run away. I'm not going to be using it, but I know people are a big fan of this. Um, the next skill that we learn of, though, is decontamination. This one, we don't get a description of this, but we learn what the tier does uh, or tier two does. So we kind of get an idea of what this skill is. Uh, but you gain a slightly increased chance to recover from infections naturally. So just like other Bethesda games, you may catch a sickness or um, have some effect on you. And this just gives you a slight chance of recovering from that naturally without having to take a, a potion or whatever the equivalent is in this game. So that one's pretty cool. Um, but moving on to the next one is leadership. One of the tiers, it essentially grants your companions a 15% boost to affinity. 
Um, so with that being said, I imagine the other tiers are just kind of built around boosting up your companion's effectiveness across the board. Um, maybe it is just kind of with relationship building. I imagine though, it's also going to increase their damage or their accuracy or just their ability to uh, be a better companion to you. The next skill that we learn of is rapid reloading. The description says in the chaos of combat, the seconds needed to reload your weapon could be the difference between life and death. This one's pretty straightforward. You reload quicker so that you can kill quicker you know, invest in this skill so you can kill quicker. <laughs> Astrophysics is the next one that we learn of. We see what tier two is, and then it gives you a 10% chance to discover a trait when scanning. And it also allows you to scan moons. Um, this one, I, I imagine all the other tiers are just revolved around scanning planets. Maybe you get more information from it or it allows you to scan other items. Um, so this one's all about scanning planets. The next one we learn of is chemistry. Again, we just learn what uh, tier two is, and that allows you to create improved chems and research additional chems at a research lab. This one's pretty straightforward. It's kind of like potions. Um, it allows you to create active effects that you can consume. Um, and again, it'll just allow you to make that a little more effective or a little bit better. And then the next one that we learn of, it doesn't give us a screenshot, but we do have one of the the developers there kind of explain it and that's Xeno sociology. It allows you to control the mind of aliens and I'll put it on the screen, the different con controls that we can have over the aliens, but this one's pretty cool if you want to control those aliens. The next skill that we learn of is boost pack. Again, this is one we don't really get a screenshot of the description or tiers. We just kind of get a gameplay and a little bit of commentary from a developer. Um, but we do see in the clip that they show that while the player is shooting, it actually sl slows down the gameplay, which is pretty cool. So if you're flying through the air, you can go in slow motion and just wreak havoc on the people below you, uh, which when you pair this with some other skills we'll cover later that increase uh, your, your grenade damage, I think would be pretty fun. You just kind of fly above them, huck down a bunch of grenades and watch them blow up before you land down, which this one is definitely a must for me. <laughs> I'm going to invest in boost pack kind of right off the back. Uh, right off the bat. And then the next skill that we learn of uh, through a developer is Neuro Strikes. Um, and somehow this just makes your punching OP. I'll play the gameplay in the background for a second here. Um, but it, it just allows you to destroy some people. Also, I do want to take a second just to talk about how awesome the hand-to-hand -hand combat looks in this. Like not just melee where you have a butcher knife or um, some type of knife or sword or axe, but just punching someone looks really satisfying. So I think that's pretty sweet. And punching people is a great transition to the next skill. Uh, but before we jump into that one, the next nine skills that I'm going to be talking about here, these ones, we don't get any description. We don't get any tiers, um, but we do just look at the title and kind of the picture that it shows us on the skill tree. So this one's going to be a lot of speculation, a lot of ideas. I could very well be wrong. Um, and if you have a different idea, put it down in the comments. I'm, I'm very curious what you guys think these skills are going to be. Uh, but like I said, punching martial arts is the next skill title that we see. I think this one is going to be melee damage, possibly hand to hand combat um, and just kind of improving that one, which is pretty cool. Um, we also see instigation. Um, I'm assuming this is uh, our ability to get someone to do what you want through a threatening dialogue. We have, you know, persuasion and different skills like that or different benefits we get when we look at the backgrounds. Um, but this one, I think, is when you're forcing someone through a threat, it's going to make them more likely to do what you want. You've officially made it through half of the skills, so if you've made it this far, it would mean the world to me if you just take just a second, leave a like, subscribe, that way you can be up to date with all my new content that I can be putting out with Starfield. It really does help me out more than you think. Um, but without any more delay, let's jump right into the next skill, which is Outpost Management. This one, I assume, would just allow you to make your outpost a little more efficient, uh, whether that's in resource collecting or reducing the amount of resource that it requires to run your outpost. I'm assuming this would just make your outpost a, a little bit better. Um, the next skill we see is marksmanship. Uh, this one's a little bit little curious because when you look at the picture that I'll put on the screen, it's actually an arrow. But I don't imagine that there's bows in this game. I, I don't think bows would be very effective in low gravity or no gravity. The arrow would just kind of fly off. Um, so I, I don't know. Let me know if you think there's going to be bows or crossbows in this game. I don't think there is. I'm assuming this would just be to improve your weapon accuracy. Um, but actually, I have no idea on this one. So let me know what you think in the comments. Sniper certification. Um, this one we can 
pretty well guess that in one way or another, it's going to improve your sniper. Um, I'm actually really excited to see how snipers work in this game. We only saw one little clip kind of at the end of the showcase um, on using a sniper, uh, which I don't know. I, I wish they showed a little bit more. It almost kind of concerns me that maybe snipers aren't a big part of the game, but I really like the idea of sitting outside the battlefield and just kind of sniping in and picking people off. Um, so if snipers are good in this game, I, I do see myself investing in this skill pretty early on, but we don't really know if snipers are good in this game yet. So we'll wait and see. Um, the next skill we see is targeting. Uh, the picture of this is a pistol, so it, it, it may improve our pistols, but I actually think it's going to be uh, more so for accuracy. We're going to we're going to talk a little bit more about this at the very end of the video. You'll see why it was in the previous showcase. So we get a little bit more detail, um, but we don't know if they've changed this at all. Um, I think it's going to be more so just kind of for accuracy, but because I think there is a, a pistol certification skill already, it doesn't really make sense to double up on pistols, but who knows? Uh, we'll have to wait and see on this one. Outpost engineering is the second outpost skill that we've seen. Um, I think this one relates a little bit more to what you can actually build, um, whether it's unlocking better buildings, uh, maybe cooler cooler looking designs. Um, I think it's going to be more so the resource collecting items, whether it's like a drill or a little area for an indoor farm uh, for plants. I think that's what this is going to focus on, but I'm not really sure. I just think with engineering, it's going to be more about making your outpost more efficient with the physical buildings. Now, the final two skills that we see in this showcase are very similar. One is missile weapon system. Um, I'm assuming it allows you to either buy, build, or install missile systems to your ship. Um, or really, it, I'm sure it just kind of improves what you already have there. I, I don't think that you would have to invest in the skill to uh, buy or build them, but maybe you can buy or build uh, missile weapon systems that are better or more efficient, or there's certain skill rating. Uh, maybe, I, who knows? Um, the next skill, though, is particle weapon system. Same idea, but with particle beams instead of missiles. Uh, same idea, we'll kind of have to wait and see, but I think it's just going to make them a little bit better. All right, we're almost at the end, guys. Uh, the last ones I wanted to cover were the skills that we saw in the 2022 official reveal trailer or kind of showcase. We just don't know if these are going to be in the final build or if they've changed. I'll, I'll run you through the details that we know on it or kind of the tier levels that were shown to us, but it's very likely that these have changed quite a bit, just like the backgrounds and, and the traits changed a lot from the original showcase. But I still wanted to include them in here because they are skills that we know of one way or another. Um, I wanted to cover heavy weapon certification first because it's really safe to assume this is going to be in the final build one way or another. And then they show us what rank three or tier three gives us, and that's going to be 30 more damage resistance while aiming with your heavy weapon. Moving on to the next one, we see Demolition. Rank 2 of this gives your explosives 30% more damage, and they also have a 30% larger radius. Um, so this is going to be all about making your explosives or your grenades better. Um, tier 2 seems pretty legit, though. 30% more damage and 30% larger radius is pretty insane. Makes me think of Borderlands, <laughs> where you're just hucking grenades all the time, and they're totally OP. Um, so if it is as good as the original showcase shows, I'm definitely going to be investing in Demolition. Um, the next one we see is Ballistics. Rank 3 increases your ballistic weapon range by 30%. Um, I'm very curious to see how often we use these standard ballistic weapons. Um, because in the lower gravity or no gravity, it does shoot you back. It sounds like they're not the most accurate. So I'm curious if this is going to be like the base weapon that we mostly use. And then things like laser weapons and stuff are going to be secondary. Um, we'll have to wait and see. But I did want to finish on targeting. We covered this earlier in the showcase, um, but in in the showcase, in this video, but in the original showcase, um, we actually see that it improves your hip fire accuracy. We don't know if this is going to change, um, but it's, I guess, pretty safe to assume that it's going to be regarding accuracy or hip fire accuracy. Um, super interesting there. It's just going to make you a little bit better at shooting your gun. But that is it, guys. <laughs> we finally made it to the end. In this video, we are going to take a deep dive in the magic system that was teased to us. I actually went through every single frame of every bit of gameplay that has been given to us so far just to see if I could find any little bits of detail that we may have missed. I did find a couple things that are going to be very interesting that I think you guys are going to like. I really do think this is the most thorough or intricate video on the magic system that is on YouTube. I really haven't seen much out there, so I really do hope you guys enjoy. 
Before we do jump into the video though, it really would mean the world to me if you take just a couple seconds, hit the subscribe button, turn on the notification bell so you know when I come out with uh, more content on Starfield. Also hit the like button for this video, it really does mean more to me than you can imagine. All right, with all that taken care of, let's go ahead and jump right into the video. I, I want to start off by, first of all, is there magic in Starfield? And if there is, how do we define magic? So let's turn to what Todd Howard has to say about magic. Going to space, I think there's a magic in just defying gravity and taking off from a planet. Like that's, it's extremely difficult human endeavor. It is a world that you get transported to that you can really make your own. And that's where, you know, for me, the magic is. All right, you heard it straight from Todd's mouth. Magic for him is taking off from a planet and defying gravity, as well as being implanted in a new world that we can make our own. So there you go. Magic is confirmed. There you go. Thanks for uh, joining in the video and we'll see you in the next one. Okay, okay. All jokes aside, you guys are actually here, most likely because you saw this little clip from last showcase. Well, if you guys are anything like me, when you first saw that little clip in, in the showcase, you had a little mini seizure or maybe peed yourself a little. I, I won't tell you whether or not I did, but I do want to take a look at really what this means. Is there really a full through and through magic system in Starfield? We don't really know. We haven't been given all too much outside of this little clip here, but I do want to take a deep dive into the story of Starfield, at least that we know of so far, because I believe the magic system is directly tied in with the story. After going through the story, I do want to share one little clip that I did find in the showcase that may point towards the fact that there is going to be a intricate magic system, not just this one little power that we did see. Now, I do want to preface this entire video with the fact that we don't really know that much about the main story, uh, nor do we know much uh, about the magic system. That's obviously why you guys are here, because we weren't really given much in the showcase. But when it comes to the story, I am going to be kind of bridging some gaps. I am going to be speculating on a few things. So don't don't roast me if it's uh, disagreeing with what you guys think is the main story. But I do imagine that there is going to be a heated discussion in the comments section about what the main story really is going to be or a few hints that were given. So by all means, if you have a different view than me, just put it in the comments section. I'm sure there's a lot of people that agree with you. Um, obviously, I don't know everything, but I am going to be presenting my opinions on the main story and how it connects to the magic system. So again, I, I hope you guys do enjoy it. Let's go ahead and get started with the story. So we know the bulk of the main story is going to revolve around the artifacts. We don't know exactly where we're going to start the game. Uh, my guess is we're going to start at Sidonia, which is the mining city on Mars. Uh, from the showcase, we see that we're guided at an elevator. We're given a helmet, of course, so we are safe. Um, shortly after we go down the elevator and start mining, we come in contact with an artifact. After touching it, we see a vision and that causes us to be incapacitated. And then that's where we then wake up and see this. Hey, come on, come on. Okay, take it easy. You were out cold. Uh, no physical damage. Mentally, the jury's still out. You know who you are? New recruit for Argos Extractors? Ring any bells? Any of this look familiar? Well, we are here, I do want to mention, if you look at the, the person on the right side that's holding the artifact, I mean, he's holding it just fine. He obviously didn't have any vision from it, or at least so it seems. He's just kind of holding it, chilling, like, hey, look, I, I found this thing next to your, your body that was unconscious. This makes me wonder, are we special? Is it kind of like the Dragonborn, where we're the only ones that can speak uh, the dragon language? Is this kind of the same thing, where we're the only one that can see the visions? However, one small detail that I'm about to show you makes me think maybe we're not the only ones that can see it, and all the members of Constellation or some of them can. So, you found something? The new guy found it. You dug up the artifact, right? That means you saw it. The visions? Well, this doesn't confirm that he has actually seen the visions. It does mean we're not the only ones that have seen it. Sounds like they're pretty familiar with the idea of visions from these uh, fragments. So we can't be the only special one that can see these. All right, so after we meet with this guy, it looks like we're then directed to the Constellation headquarters, which is in the city Atlantis, or New Atlantis. 
We then go to their headquarters where we meet all the members of Constellation and they kind of give us a rundown of what the heck is going on, why I saw this vision, what these artifacts are, and it kind of gives us an idea of uh, what we're supposed to be doing from that point. And then we're told that's kind of our job is to find more of these fragments, to build these rings, and then figure out what the secrets of the universe are. Now, I do also want to point out the fact that once the fragments are put together in a ring, multiple rings then kind of make a sphere shape. But these rings and these spheres do vary in size. Uh, maybe I'm looking a little bit too deeply and it's just kind of the angle that the camera's at. But it looks like some of these are massive where your entire body can go inside the middle with lots of room to spare inside that sphere. Others are a lot smaller. Take the one in the Constellation headquarters. That one looked pretty small. There's no way I could fit inside there. So then we're kind of left to wonder, are there varying uh, powers given from these spheres? Are some power giving where we then get the superpower or let's say we, we get an aspect of the magic system and others are simply just a step in the right direction, meaning we create a sphere at that constellation headquarters and it gives us a full on vision or directions to where we can find more artifacts or where we can find those massive buildings that, that hold some of the secrets. That's kind of what I'm leaning towards. I think the smaller uh, fragments or those uh, rings once they form into the sphere, the smaller ones are more direction giving or vision giving, while the large massive ones that we get encircled in, that's when, when we're given special powers or uh, uh, further knowledge from the intelligent life that's outside the universe or solar system that we know of. I do also want to point out the fact that both these fragments, these rings, as well as the objects around the rings actually defy gravity. This is exactly what the superpower magic system was teased to do as well. It, it defied gravity. It caused the people to kind of float around um, where essentially there was no gravity in that room. So somehow, obviously, <laughs> these rings are directly correlated with the power that we are then given and teased in, in the showcase. Now again, this magic system, this ability to defy gravity, ties directly to the main story and those rings. So we have to imagine that this superpower that we are given has to progress us through the main story as well. So I wouldn't say it's too far-fetched to assume that there's certain locations that we can come across in the settled systems or certain secret locations that we have to have this power to be able to progress or open a doorway or get in through a specific passageway that then allows us to learn more and more of what this uh, alien intelligence or whoever is controlling these, these rings, whatever they want to tell us, we have to have this power to then progress and learn more and develop um, our abilities with this to progress in the main story. The conclusion of the main story, this is where I really speculate what I think is going to happen. I think once we progress and we find the rings, we're given the various powers that we need to then progress, get closer to what this intelligence wants us to know. I think we'll then be guided to control or manipulate a black hole. Then once we go through the black hole, we'll be brought to a different solar system that uh, or kind of part of the universe that hasn't been discovered yet, this solar system then hinting towards intelligent alien life. That's where I think the main story is going to end. And then that's where Starfield 2 is going to kick us off. If you're invested in the Starfield community, you know intelligent alien life is kind of a sensitive topic. It's very controversial, but I really do believe that either there will be some sort of intelligent alien life in this game, or it's going to be hinted at and then kind of taken over in Starfield 2 where there will be intelligent alien life. I mean, we know the, the whole point of the main story is figuring out what's out there. And I think that's intelligent alien life. But let me know what you think in the comment section on that. All right, now that we just went through the entire main story and how that connects to the magic system, at least as so far as I believe, you may be thinking worthy, like, okay, all, all that's great, but you really haven't told us how the magic system relates to combat or whether there's a through and through magic system and it's not just a one-off power that we have. Well, I, I promise I did my due diligence. I went through every single frame of every bit of gameplay that we saw, and I was really hoping that I could just get one little glance at a maybe cooldown meter or something in the bottom right hand corner during the combat. But I saw nothing, absolutely nothing. Now, obviously, they're going to try to hide this because, you know, they gave us that one little teaser and that's the only thing that we've seen so far. So it makes sense that they would cut out any gameplay that may have a cooldown. But it's also possible, again, it could be like the Skyrim shouts where you shout the word and then there's a couple second cooldown, but you don't really see anything on the screen indicating whether there is a cooldown or not. 
Now, while I didn't find anything directly in the combat that indicated that the player used this ability or this uh, magic that we may be given, I did find something very interesting. And this is actually in the menus. When you look at the general menu, you see four different dots that indicate a certain section that you can choose from, whether that's looking at your weapon, your inventory, or maybe a map. You know, these four dots can be picked for the certain section. However, in this one shot, you see a fifth dot right at the top. Now, there's no words there. We have no idea what this actually is. I think this is a special menu that unlocks only once you receive that first sphere supernatural power, that first magical ability of uh, distorting gravity. I think that's when this menu unlocks. And then when you go in there, you can customize uh, in one way or another this supernatural power, whether it's choosing from different types or you can customize it just a little bit and how it works. I think this fifth dot is that menu where you can choose it and it only unlocks once you get that power. That's why it didn't show up earlier in the menu when you can only see the four dots. And I think they just kind of messed up and added a clip of the menu with the five dots. You may think this isn't really a big deal, but I think it is because if they have a dedicated section in the menu for this magic system, again, this is just my opinion, but if they do have that there, it means that there is a full on magic system. They wouldn't have this dedicated menu if you only get this one ability of defying gravity or distorting gravity, right? They would only have this menu if you can select or customize your supernatural powers. So I think every time you go inside one of those large circles, you're gonna be given a certain type of power. And when you go into another one, you'll get a different type of power, just like the Skyrim shouts. When you get the, the reading on the walls, or in this case, when you step inside the rings, you'll get a certain power that you can then customize within this menu. Welcome everyone, my name is Worthy Pickle and this is your channel for all things Starfield. Can you guys believe we're just a couple weeks away from selling out our careers and family life just to play Starfield? I can't either, and with how big this game is supposed to be, I really do need your help. Uh, I have a lot of video ideas in mind for when the game comes out, but if there's any specific feature or aspect of the game that you want me to cover as soon as possible, please let me know in the comment section below so I can prioritize making those videos that you'd like to see. And then, of course, I'll drizzle in the videos that I want to make as well. With that being said, let's go ahead and jump into the video that you came here for. Starfield is one of the most ambitious games ever made. It amazes me how technology has brought us to the point in gaming where we can explore over a thousand planets and have near limitless options on how we play a game. The beauty of Bethesda games is not in their graphics, their storytelling, and it's most definitely not in their ability to release a perfectly polished game. But the thing that makes Bethesda games so special is the amount of freedom that you have to be who you want to be and do what you want to do. And Starfield is no different. You have the freedom to do exactly what you want to do. If you want to strictly play the main story and then never touch the game again, you can totally do that. If you want to spend hours not touching a single quest, but instead running around, stealing from people's houses, pitpocketing, murdering and looting bodies, and then flying off into space just to hijack and sell ships, and then use your wealth to live a life on the countryside, you can do that. If you want to build a business and become the richest person in the universe by setting up hundreds of mining and manufacturing outposts and trade routes, you can totally do that. Do you see where I'm getting at though? There's so many options in this game. There's endless freedom to choose what you want to do and what you don't want to do. There's so many aspects and features of this game that are totally separated from one another. So if you want to pick and choose what you want to do, you have the freedom to do that. Now, there are a couple things in the game though that you simply can't ignore. And one of those is the economy system. Now, with all the information that Bethesda has given us on this game, they've really only hinted at different aspects of the economy and banking system. So in this video, we're going to break down everything that we do know and ultimately give you a good idea of the scope and purpose of the economy system in Starfield, as well as give you an idea of some aspects of the game that have been hinted at. And then, of course, once the game is released, you can expect a more thorough video from me about the economy system and the best ways to manipulate that and make the most money in your playthrough. So why is the economy system so important and why can't you just ignore it in your playthrough? Well, Starfield's going to have a few progression hindering features that are going to require you to invest credits into your starship to reach different parts of the game map. One example of this is the grav drive system in your spaceship. Zoom out even further to see all the systems in this part of the galaxy. Here you can plot a course to ones that are light years away. This uses your ship's grav drive to fold space and jump to these systems, 
and you will need to upgrade your ship and skills if you want to jump to the most distant ones. So from this little clip here, we can see that you'll need to be able to upgrade your grav drive to travel to further solar systems if you want to explore there. The last thing you're going to want is to try to travel to a further solar system to explore and see what's there for whatever reason, and you can't travel there because you have no credits to upgrade your grav drive. At some point, you will need to upgrade that grav drive and you will need credits for that. So then, what are some ways that you can make credits in this game? There's a lot, so just to list a few, you could be rewarded for completing missions, whether that's from main quests, side stories, or even random encounters. You can of course find credits while you're out and about, like finding a few credits here and there sitting around on tables or on bodies that you left uh, sleeping after a fight. You can also make money by boarding enemy ships in space, killing the crew and stealing their ships. You'll of course need to get their ship licensed, but then you can sell that ship for profit. Also, based on some hints that we've seen while shown Neon, it looks like we'll be able to get involved in some drug trafficking, and I'd love to see some quests that involved a few intricate heists on Neon as well. We saw a small glimpse of an assassination or mercenary work to get money. And if we look closer at one of the starter skills, Commerce, it reads, In the settled system's free market economy, almost anyone with the right skill set can open and run a successful business. Shout out to the free market economy in Starfield. It sounds like we'll be able to set up and automate various businesses in the game. Now, there's multiple skills dedicated to settlements and outpost building. So from the wording of this, it sounds different. You can let me know what you guys think, but it sounds like maybe we can operate a storefront or a restaurant to earn money on the side. Who knows how in-depth this system may be, but it sounds awesome to set up a low-maintenance source of income like a business. And as I mentioned earlier, you can also build mining settlements to extract various resources across different planets. These resources have different grades of value to them, as you can see from the different star counts on these resources. Not only can you mine and sell those resources, but you can then take those mine materials, set up a trade route, and transport those resources to a different location that you say dedicated for a manufacturing facility, and then by hiring people to transport and combine those resources to build a specific higher value item, you can build an entire system that mines, extracts, transports, and then manufactures items that you can sell for massive profit. This is one system that I am really excited for for building wealth. It sounds like it's going to be a bit later in the game, but this is how you're going to be able to uh, build just massive amounts of wealth by having these very intricate trade routes and systems for creating items to sell. Now, one thing we don't know about that I have a lot of questions for is how the economy system works when it comes to different solar systems. Is it going to be one massive economy or is it going to be sectioned off to who controls those systems? For example, if I set up a manufacturing facility and I'm selling tons of, I don't know, t-shirts, and I just start flooding the market with millions of these t-shirts, eventually are those t-shirts values going to decrease, therefore decreasing my profits. But then if I ship them and spread them out to different solar systems and then sell the items across the solar systems, will I keep my profits up? We don't know. That sounds more like a no man's sky type of system with the economy. I don't think it's going to be that intricate. I looked for it in here and I didn't see anything, but I'd be very curious to see how that's going to work. And then lastly, you'll be able to make some money by trading or selling items like food, weapons, armor, just kind of random crap that you find like any Bethesda game. Uh, but those are just some of the main uh, ways that I found that you can make credits in this game. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of other ways, but those are the ones that we've we've seen in the showcase. While we literally saw zero examples on how much money you actually make from each of these activities, they did show us plenty of examples on how expensive certain items are. But before we look at those items, I did want to talk about the potential banking system in Starfield. When we look at the dream home trait, the description says, you own a luxurious customizable house on a peaceful planet. Unfortunately, it comes with a $50,000 credit mortgage with Gal Bank that has to be paid weekly. The bank can also be seen here in New Atlantis. I'll show a picture on the screen so that you can see it. There's actually a physical location for the bank, and it's not just some mythical debt that you have out there in the ether. It's actually there from an actual bank. From this, we know that you can also have credit in the game. At least you can have a credit mortgage. Now, what we don't know is whether or not you can use this credit outside of this single trait or for this specific mortgage. For example, if I want to get a loan to purchase and start a 
business, will I be able to do that? Or can I get approved for more or less on the loan depending on my standing with the United Nations or the bank or really how much money I make? We also know this debt is paid each and every week. While we don't know, I assume that if we don't have enough money, we'll go in the negative. Uh, or maybe just a random person from the bank will find us and demand we give him various items we have in our backpack that can make up the money that we owe them. <laughs> well, it's a very simple thing that they showed us in the showcase. This really opens up the door for so many possibilities if Bethesda really decided to uh, make a true banking system. And I find that not a whole lot of people are talking about this. People have pointed out the bank, but not many people have talked about what it actually means if there is a full-fledged banking system in Starfield. And lastly, let's take a look at the various ships and items they showed us in the deep dive video. Looking at the weapons we saw in the showcase, the values are actually kind of all over the place. Items in Starfield are put into different categories based on their rarity, just like a lot of games out there. In the showcase, we saw normal rarity, rare, and legendary items. As I'll show you though, just because it's more rare may not mean it's actually worth more. For example, we have this rare shotgun that's valued at 15,000 credits, and this cool looking beam rifle at 11,000 credits. But then we were also shown another rare weapon, and it's only worth 3,000 credits. So what does this all mean? Well, I think the answer is actually quite simple. I think it just depends what level you are when you come across the weapon. For example, if you're level 5 and you come across a rare rifle, it may only be worth 3,000 credits. But if you come across a rare weapon when you're level 25, it may be worth a lot more. And this tells us that there's going to be weapon and armor scaling in Starfield, which I think is fantastic. So later on in the game, it's easier to come across more credits because the items that you're coming across are going to be worth more because they're scaled to a higher level, which I think just makes the economy balanced out much, much better. You know, if, if you're later in the game, it's going to be easier to acquire credits, even if you don't want to invest a bunch of time and money into building a business or an outpost. You can find weapons and sell them for more and just use that to fund the projects that you need. A really good example of this is when we're shown a legendary mining helmet that's only worth a thousand credits. Its stats really aren't that great, presumably because the player is lower level, but it does come with some cool player buffs besides the normal protection stats. But again, I think this just proves that if you're lower level, you know, things are going to be worth less, even if it is a higher rarity. I also imagine in Starfield, it's going to be like other Bethesda games where you may find an item and it's going to tell you one value, but then when you actually go to sell the items, the trader will offer you uh, much less for the item itself. And I think we also see this when they show us the ship builder with the frontier. You actually have to go to a specific trader or vendor when upgrading your ship. Uh, and you can see in the top right here where it shows that there's your credits and the vendor's credits that you are actually talking with a vendor here. And there's a lot of people that are actually pretty concerned that our starter ship is only worth 7,000 credits for an entire spaceship. I mean, we saw weapons or food items that cost a fraction of that, if not equal to the cost of our entire ship. And I have a few thoughts on this. One, as I mentioned before, the values shown in our inventory are often higher than what the vendors will actually pay for us. So as we see here, this is what the vendor will actually pay for us versus the items in our inventory. They're going to be valued a little bit higher. Higher. That's not what the actual vendor is going to offer us. Two, this is our starter ship. So it comes to no surprise that the ship we get for free at the start of the game is going to be crappy and cheap. Otherwise, right when we get the ship, we're just going to sell it right away to buy a different ship, right? <laughs> so we kind of got to be stuck with it. It's going to be cheap and crappy. And then ships later on, as we see, are going to be worth a little bit more. Third, and lastly, Bethesda has the hard job of balancing the economy, so we can't just use a simple mechanic to make tons of money right out the gate. So while it might not make sense for the immersion side of things, it does make sense that we'll sell ships for much less than they may actually be worth or should be worth. For example, you know, we could just go out and hijack a bunch of ships, get them licensed, and then sell them for a ton of money. So it makes sense that ships are going to be worth a little bit less. So if we hijack and get them licensed, you know, it's all just this big balancing act. So we can't just break a mechanic of the game to make a ton of money. So it, to me, it makes sense that we may spend 100,000 credits to upgrade our ship, make it pretty nice, but then we only sell it for 50,000. It's all just simplifying uh, for game balancing. 
Now I want to stress, this doesn't mean that every ship is going to be completely worthless. They actually showed us plenty of ships that I'll show you here on the screen that are going to be very late game because they are really, really expensive. Again, this is why it's going to be so important to set up multiple income streams in this game so that you can afford these cool ships in the game. <laughs> There's so much to this game that we just don't know about and don't understand. The unknown is what has me so excited for this game and I really can't wait to get my hands on it and see what's out there. Did you know I launched a channel Patreon? If you'd like to support the channel further, consider checking it out. The link's going to be down in the description. Every dollar that is donated is being reinvested right back into the channel. So if you'd like to learn more, again, the link's down in the description, so feel free to check it out. Uh, but let me know what you guys think in the comments, uh, what you think about this economy system in Starfield. But until next time, stay worthy.